There are so many different ways in which that... There are so many ways in which you can run a Monster of the Week type of game. But did you know that there are multiple different ways in which those monsters could behave, and the different ways they behave could help you to run a better game? How? Well, find out. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and we're talking about running Monster of the Week type of adventures. Now obviously Monster of the Week is a reference from television um, or the plot of the week, the baddie of the week, the MacGuffin of the week, the pineapple of the week, call it what you will. The idea is that each adventure is focused on a specific villain or a big bad, whether that is part of a giant epic campaign or an open campaign or whatever type of campaign you're running. And if you don't remember what types of campaigns there are, check out a week or two video ago where we talk about the different types of campaigns. But you are running effectively a monster or group of monsters or horde of monsters. Every single adventure, it's different. So how do you make it feel different? How do you avoid following the formula and becoming predictable? Well, the sad truth is you're going to end up following a formula. But there are multiple formulas, and if you learn how to tweak and adjust each one of those formulas, you are going to be able to create adventures which feel as if each one is completely different, but at the same time haven't taxed you too much as a creative to have to come up with them. So when we look at the different types of monsters, I think the important thing for us to first look at is the different type of adventures. Now I have done a video on the different type of adventures, quite an extensive video as a matter of fact, so I'm not going to rehash that. Suffice it to say, suffice it to say, um, Suffice it to say, three times in a row, I think that's sufficient. Um, thwarting adventures, collecting adventures, delivering adventures, and discovering adventures. Now, if we use those four different adventure types as the basis for looking at Monsters of the Week, we come up with four very different styles of monster engagement. There are millions of monsters for us to choose from. It doesn't matter what system you are running, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons or whether it's science fiction, all of that is irrelevant. What is important to bear in mind is that we will have four very different playing styles. And each of those playing styles is going to influence the party in terms of how they react and how they operate and how they engage with your big bad. So what are the four different types? Well, very frank, very simply, the four types are heavy hitters. And I'm going to go through each of these different types as to how the adventure rolls out. So don't panic just yet. So it's heavy hitters. Those are monsters that are particularly strong or powerful. A horde of goblins, a single dragon, something that is very much in the face of the PCs. It's going to be very dangerous to fight this particular villain. They're going to know about the villain straight away. They're going to go in there. They're going to try and overcome that villain by brute force. And they might try and use their wits to outmaneuver the villain. But effectively, it's just a heavy hitter. Darth Vader for Luke Skywalker was a heavy hitter. The Predator versus Arnold Schwarzenegger's character in Predator was just a heavy hitter. There was no subtlety about it. We knew who the bad guy was, and it was just about going in there and basically overcoming the bad guy, using intelligence and cunning and guile and all that kind of stuff. But effectively, that's what that uh, heavy hitter is like. You then get the races. Now, the races are not necessarily super powerful, or at least they're not super physically powerful. They might have a lot of mental acumen. But the races are trying to achieve something, something that is going to bring about the end of the world, the end of the universe, the end of the galaxy, the end of mankind, uh, the end of free political thought. Who knows? They are racing towards something. They are assembling the thing to build the big thing that's going to open a portal that will allow demons into the world. They themselves are not physically strong, and the players are not necessarily going to know whom they are fighting. They're just going to know that they are on a race to get there first. That's the important type of villain in this particular case. The PCs and the villain are racing to get somewhere, to achieve something, to do something. 
find the center of the tomb. And there's another group of PCs or NPCs, but they're adventurers that are racing to get there. So racing is another type of villain that you could include. The third type of villain is the one that um, there is no other way of putting it. They are the chasers. These are villains who are after the PCs for something. Bounty hunters, assassins. It could be the PCs have some knowledge that they must uh, give out to the villain so that the villain can conquer the world. Um, the villain needs the codes to the nuclear submarine. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is that they are after, they are chasing the PCs. The PCs might have knowledge of a secret invasion fleet hiding in the nebula. They are being chased by the villain. Do you start to see how each of these different ones, and we've only looked at the three of the four so far, how each one of these is going to give you a very different feeling in terms of your adventure? I think, I think it becomes quite obvious. And then the final one is the shadow villain. This is the unknown. This is the murder mystery, who killed whom, who did what, what is going on. This is Professor Moriarty, who's pulling the strings from behind, from the back. Now... These are very similar, by the way, in terms of thinking of your big bad for a campaign and the epic campaign style of thing. Your nemesis, uh, blunt force, never present, and then the mentor. These are similar, but not the same. And the, the reason is because of the ways in which these adventures are playing out. So, heavy hitters, racers, chasers, and then shadows. Now, let's look at a typical adventure that you would then run for a heavy hitter. In order for us to understand that this is a heavy hitter, we need to establish that right up at the front of our adventure. So in our adventure cycle, in our five steps of the adventure, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a video called The Five Step Method, so look for that video. The five steps that our characters are going to go on. The introduction, where we learn about the plot, the, the introduction to plot. They are going to very specifically encounter this villain. Maybe not personally. It could be there's a giant battle going on and they see this impressive demon wading through the troops of the allies, just annihilating everyone. And as they're trying to get there to fight the big bad, the battle is called off. They are forced to surrender. You are demonstrating the immense power of this heavy hitter. It, couldn't, it could also be much smaller. The heavy hitter rips off the doors of the keep, strides in, kills the king in the first round of, of combat, and the player's are going, oh, I, I fire an arrow. It bounces off his skin. I slash him with my sword. Deal your damage. It doesn't even seem to dent the armor of this individual, and they don't care about you. That's extreme uh, forms. Now, this channel is all about extreme, so you can always tie it, pull it back a little bit and make it less extreme. But the point is, in that very first engagement, the PCs need to learn how powerful this monster is. It could also be a horde of monsters. So they kill three three orcs and they go, ha ha, we have defeated the orcs. And then they hear the war drums and they see a thousand orcs marching towards them. They are going to have to run away and find help. Hopefully. I mean, well, it is PCs. So that is the introduction. Then we get the journey to plot. Uh, well, the, 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 the journey. And as they are going on this journey, they are going to learn more about the heavy hitter. Legends, a mural, uh, a survivor of a battle. Oh, he was terrible, he was. He came out of the night and struck us dead. I survived, or oh, I got better. I mean, I don't know. You know. So the journey is about them discovering more about this particular villain. And then when they get to the um, turning point where they realize it's not the plot, that is the point in a heavy hitter journey where they then understand that the heavy hitter is not just a giant brute, but is doing something. Now, this is not, it, it, it's, it's not something like uh, they're trying to build a portal to take over the world. It could be, but it should be something a little bit more focused on the, the master monster. So if they kill this big bad or if they wipe out the horde or if they do something, that will cause the entire problem to go away. This is the final important point to make when it comes to these particular type of villains and several of the other ones you're going to see later on. They have to be defeatable and when they are defeated, the PCs should feel as if that adventure is over.
There should be no lingering kind of, oh, well, yes, you killed him, but the thought stealer has been released and, and that sort of thing. That should terminate. You can have a lieutenant or a junior or a something survive the battle and pick up that banner later. But what is important is that they will only come back three or four adventures from now, or if they do come back in the next adventure, it's a different type of villain from the one that the PCs have just fought. You don't want to have heavy hitter, heavy hitter, heavy hitter, heavy hitter. That's not what we want. We want to alternate it up. So heavy hitter, a chaser, then maybe another heavy hitter, then a shadow, then a race, and then... Uh, so it's it, that's the power here, folks, is to be able to shuffle and shunt and move around as we need to in order to have these good stories. Once they realize that there's something bigger to that, then they journey to the new plot, which is then when the big bad tries to stop them, the horde tries to intercept them, they send people after them, all those kind of wonderful things. And then finally, the big showdown with a heavy hitter, of course, is going to be facing off against that heavy hitter. Now, the party can come up with ingenious ways to debilitate the monster or the horde of monsters or the group of assassins or whatever the all heavy hitters are. That's absolutely fine. That's up to them. Let them do that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's brilliant play. But they will ultimately face off against this heavy hitter and defeat the heavy hitter, hopefully, and then call it a triumph. When it comes to races, races are all about establishing that there is a race in the first place. And there are many, many, many ways of launching this. Again, if we're going through those five steps, the first step, of course, is an introduction to the race. We need to know it's a race. The race has to start somewhere. It could be, oh, we found this half of a treasure map. It could be the Indiana Jones foible. They have the headpiece of the Staff of Ra, and that will lead them to the sacred tomb. We have to get to the tomb before they do. We have to uncover the secret book. We have to find this. We have to find that. You must hurry. The never-ending story, that f film from the 80s that traumatized so many of us, that whole thing was a race. We have to get somewhere before the darkness, the nothing, the oblivion, the gamork catches up with us. I mean, that's that's truly terrifying. That was absolutely terrifying. Complete race example. So the monster, the villain, is racing to try and get to the PCs. This means that unlike the heavy hitter, who is demonstrating their power against the player characters, the racer is going to be trying to slow them down, is going to be throwing obstacles in their way, red herrings, cheating, doing everything that they can in their power to keep the player's characters from succeeding. The journey to plot, of course, should be a race. Be dramatic, have it a riverboat race with waterfalls and giant hippopotami and crocodiles and all kinds of wonderful things. An airship race, an undersea race, go mad. It should be a race. I mean, that's what the name implies. A racer. A villain, right? So it should be a race. When they finally get to the point where they realize that it's no longer a race, that's obviously where it's not the plot in our five-step method, what they then realize is, yes, we have achieved the thing. Oh, but that's only part one of the thing. There are three components to this, and the racer has got the other two. And now you need to get to stopping them from using those other two, because even the other two combined allow them to do something dastardly. Or you have got the thing, yes, but now you need to get to the mountain to destroy the thing before anybody else does. Welcome to the Lord of the Rings. Get there before that happens, otherwise the whole game is over. Okay, sure, so it's a race. The racer villain could be then looking for the PCs and they've got to sneak and they've got to do this and they've got to do that. But not too much of that, because that starts to head towards chaser territory. You want it to still be a race, and that tension is coming in from having to get to these next points. You're going to use NPCs, you're going to use lore, you're going to use history, you're going to use however you can to get information to the PCs that this is a race. Furthermore, there should also be a fairly straightforward, I don't want to say long adventure, but I want to say a, a, a pacey adventure. Put the Push the pressure on them. Now... Of course, then they get to the, the, the final showdown. The final showdown is where they win in preventing the villain from doing whatever it is that the villain is doing. Uh, if you look at Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the whole thing was a race to get to the Ark. Indiana Jones didn't defeat the villain. He defeated the thing that killed everybody by realizing what you should do. Close your eyes type of thing rather than look into the holy light of whatever was inside the Ark. 
So the PCs don't have to defeat the villain physically. They just need to achieve the goal, the whole purpose of the race first. So that's the whole idea with races. And again, I'm hoping that all you're doing is you're just going to take this template and go, OK, cool, I have a heavy hitter. I need to do this and this. How you introduce those elements and when you trigger those events to occur, that is the artistry. That is where you should be spending your time as a GM thinking about what those triggers and events are rather than trying to actually come up with the basic adventure in the first place. When we then come to chases, now the chase idea is very straightforward. It's very similar to races um, in terms of the delivery and the collection thing, uh, very similar, except that a chaser is after the PCs. And that means the PCs need to have something of value that they are not going to just go, oh, all right, you want that? Yeah, no, take it. Oh, I haven't been using the uh, dagger of God slaying recently anyway. No, you take it. Good luck with that. Yeah. You've got to give them something that they either can't give away or that they basically don't want to give away, like uh, their souls or a magical item that gives them plus three to riding unicorns. Uh, you choose whatever it is, you give it to them. Now, how you give that to them, exactly the same with Racer or with Heavy Hitter. It could be a giant battle. It could be a tomb that they're already crawling through. It's a dungeon crawl. It's a random basement. It's a spell that flies into the head of someone, thanks to Color of Magic and Terry Pratchett for that particular idea. You decide on how they're going to get this thing. You have to make sure, and this is the critical thing about a, a chase, is that it has value to the PCs not to give away. Then their journey is an escape from. So this could be they, they suddenly discover a whole bunch of assassins. Now on the surface, a whole bunch of assassins trying to kill them and get whatever it is, or a whole bunch of thieves, or a mind probe, or who knows, Romulans stealing your chief engineer. It doesn't matter. The PCs might go, oh, this is a heavy hitter. We're fighting a lot of things that are chasing us. The chase is the important thing. So they journey away from where it is. But what are they going to do with this thing? How are they going to avoid being captured by this big monster? What are they going to do to prove that they don't have or will never have or will never give this thing away? They need to know why they're being chased. And that is your turning point. That is where you discover it is not the plot. That is where they go, hang on a moment. It is the evil queen who is after us. And she is never going to stop until we do X, which is destroy the object, which could possibly be to confront and kill the queen. Either way, if it is to destroy the object, they will have to go somewhere and they're going to be chased again. They're going to be delayed. They're going to have this. They're going to have that. You're going to throw side quests at them where it's like, well, yes, you need to get there by the full moon, which is tomorrow. But there's a girl stuck um, rescuing her brother from a well and she's about to get eaten by a troll. Are you going to go there or are you going to go and try and save the girl and the troll? I mean, well, try and save the troll from the girl because you arrive and she's the super powerful warrior and whatever. I mean, play it up and twist it up and do all those kind of wonderful things. The players need to decide to stay on target, to stay focused, or to be distracted and get delayed and all those kinds of wonderful things. And then, of course, the showdown with a chaser is confronting the chaser or is destroying the thing that the chaser is after. If you, if you have a, a, a sense of drama, they destroy the thing, the chaser goes, no, now I'm defeated and I will return one day. Skeletor and He-Man, the traditional series from the 80s, was pretty much a chaser all the time. Skeletor got something and then he it got destroyed and he had to try and get it first and, and or He-Man had to get there. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is the whole notion of the chase is eventually overcoming the, 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 the villain in one way or another, thwarting them in some kind of way by taking something somewhere and doing it or protecting it and keeping it until it is of no longer it is, of, it is no longer of value for example um so there is that one and then lastly shadows shadows are the complicated ones to play because there is nothing for the players really to latch on to in the opening few sessions they're going to be going something's going on here but i'm not sure Shadows are difficult to run because your introduction to the shadow is that you don't introduce the shadow. 
subtle ways of doing things would be to have a traditionally stupid race, some race that is is um, not known for their sophistication or for their organization or for their um, understanding of technology to suddenly have got something that is beyond their capabilities. Where did this come from? That's odd. How did the orcs manage to attack the castle using those trebuchet? Orcs have never built trebuchet before. And those trebuchet didn't look like they were orcish design. They looked more like they were elvish. So you start to set up a series of events which could not have been done by the things that were involved. Or the PCs are dragged away from an important mission to a side quest. When they get there, there's nothing going on. We were distracted for this. This is why we were sent out here. Meanwhile, they get back to the castle and discover something has happened. So it's about moving the players into places where a mastermind might want to get them to go so that they don't see what's happening. Or the mastermind is manipulating events to cause things to happen and they are utilizing whatever they have and upskilling or upgrading those things to be able to be effective. So the journey component, once the players start to realize that there is something afoot, there is something strange going on, something bigger is playing out. This is where you need to be incredibly subtle, but at the same time, not so subtle that the players miss the clues. They need to understand that there is something going on and you need to give them clues as to what that might be. So in the example of our trebuchet using orcs, I mean, your orcs might use trebuchets in your world. I'm not saying that orcs don't. I'm just saying if you've established that they don't and suddenly they do, that's the cause. That's the, that's the clue. So the journey might be to the orcish camps where they find most of the orcs have either been destroyed in the battle or are leaving. Why are they leaving? Because the power is too much. It forces too much on them. It grants them too much. Something needs to tell the players in the journey phase of that five step plan that something is wrong and that there is this presence doing something. They won't know where the presence is. They won't know necessarily where to find the presence. You might give them a vagary from the east. As they journey east, when it's discover it's not plot, in this case, the five-step method changes and it becomes discover it is plot. Because at the moment, the players are going, well, I don't know if there's something big going on here, or if it's just the orcs upskilling, or if it's a this, or if it's a that. They don't really know what the plot is. So they go east slightly, they come across farmers whose fields have been destroyed by marauding goblins who are using new technology that they haven't been using before. Stick to your theme. Okay, find a goblin. That goblin will then confess and will say something obvious. If you look at Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes, he had a lot of adventures where there were big schemes going on that the common criminals couldn't possibly have known about, but he defeated those common criminals, but he never had any more information than that. It only changed when I think it was John Clay or Nicholas Clay um, in the Red-Headed League said, Moriarty's had enough of you and he's coming for you. That was the first time Sherlock Holmes actually got hint of Moriarty. I think mainly because Conan Doyle added him in later. But at the same time, the whole group then went, oh, Moriarty is an evil. So this is what you're doing at Discovery of Plot. You are giving a name to this nemesis, to this enemy, to this villain. And that name allows the PCs to then start tracking them down, which is then the journey to the new plot. And that is then, of course, ultimately where they get to a point where it's Reichenbach falls and they fight against the villain and defeat the villain ultimately now that they have come to know the villain. The villain could be powerful. The villain could be intelligent. It, the villain should be manipulative. That's the bottom line. They should be working out schemes around schemes to try and prevent things from happening. So those are my suggestions on how to be able to do Monster of the Week, Adventure of the Week. It's probably more accurate to say Monster of the Month, because if you do four sessions, you can kind of get through an adventure usually. Uh, so Monster of the Month, I suppose. That is how I would look at doing it, so that it relieves the burden from you of having to come up with a whole new plot line. You've got four plot lines here, which, as you can see by the examples I've given you, they're very different in terms of how they play out. The mechanics, the formula is still the same. You're 
you're plugging into that formula your uniqueness, your unique interpretation of how to get the players to be introduced, how to do this, how to twist that, how to do this. That is where you should be focusing your time, in my opinion. And that will obviously, hopefully, help you have a better game. It will give you a little bit to reflect upon and improve upon and to drive forward. So, if you agree, please uh, hit the like button. I think it's this, this, I don't know. Hit that like button. Maybe even leave a comment. That would be perfect. If you think that there is a type of uh, monster of the month that I have left out of the four, chat about it below. I love reading the comments because oftentimes I'll go, oh, I like that. I want to do a video on that because that's a good point. I didn't think about that. We're all human and these are, you know, it's, it's where we can learn. So comment down below. Please absolutely comment down below. And of course, hit that subscribe button. Here, 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 here. Hit the subscribe button. And uh, then you'll be notified when new videos come out. New videos come out every Monday. Um, a regular as clockwork. And um, yeah, so um, Goblin Bell, if you hit that, will uh, alert you as to when those videos come out. Um, now, something to think about. Each month, my patrons, and you can see them scrolling there, all, all of them wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, each month, my patrons get different types of rewards. And if you want to support this channel and uh, the team behind it, then consider joining our Patreon if you can, and if it doesn't tax you too much in terms of stressing finances and that sort of thing. However, every week you get a podcast and our new series has only recently launched called Musings of a GM where basically I get to rant and rave and talk about all the kinds of things that are going through my head. It's not necessarily educational. It might hopefully be inspirational at the very least. Um, so that you can get a podcast, you get battle maps that I have created for use during the month, you get uh, templates for taverns for... You can see them on the screen now. You get all these kinds of different things. The last few um, months I've been doing a Kickstarter where I've written my own TTRPG and campaign setting. The patrons have got that as a reward as opposed to the battle maps and things. So there's all kinds of things going on there. And uh, we have our own private uh, Facebook group, our own private channel within Discord and all those kinds of things which um, allow for easier communication and, and so on. And uh, it helps support the channel and allows us to continue making these videos which hopefully help improve your game. And ultimately, that is the whole reason why we're here. So to all of our patrons, I want to say a big thank you for making these videos possible. And until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.